St. John's, please stand. Thank you. Please be seated. Welcome to the fourth annual Hugh Lewin Memorial Human Rights Lecture. A special welcome to our guests, to the Right Reverend Bishop Vincent Joseph Habe, to Fiona Lloyd, Tandy and Tessa Lewin, Wilson Tim Wilson, Headmaster Mr. Stuart West, other heads and deputies from St. John's schools, to members of council, to OJs, to our staff, and to our students, welcome. To those online, and to those with us here in the beautiful Pelican Quad, welcome. The Hugh Lewin Memorial Lecture is gaining a wonderful traction. Thus far, Justice Edwin Cameron, Dr. John Carney, and Professor Patika Ntuli have addressed us on this platform. Hence, a Constitutional Court judge and human rights activist then a renowned playwright, actor, anti-apartheid campaigner and human rights activist, and lastly a poet, artist and human rights activist have spoken. There is a common theme. Our eminent speaker for today will be introduced in a few minutes and we shall see the theme continue. Who was Hugh Lewin? Let us hear him in his own words. He is spoken out of the dock at the start of the trial which saw him convicted to seven years imprisonment. You will understand the historical context of his words, spoken as they were in 1964. And I quote, My Lord, I am 24 years old. I was born in Leidenberg in the Eastern Transvaal. When I was one, my father transferred to Irini near Pretoria, where he became parish priest and chaplain to Irini homes. When I was eight, I was sent as a boarder to St. John's College an Anglican private school in Johannesburg. I matriculated there in 1956, then stayed on at school for a post-matric year in preparation for my studies at university. I wanted to become a priest, and arrangements were made for me to go first to Rhodes University and then to Theological College in England. I completed my BA at Rhodes University, Grahamstown, in 1960, but I felt then that I was not yet equipped to face the rigors and demands of the priesthood, so I postponed my trip to England. My father, my lord, was a gentle and loving man with whom I had a close and warm relationship until he died aged 80 in 1963. He brought me up to believe that all men, rich and poor, should be respected and loved as creatures of God. I have always believed and still do believe that all people are equal in the eyes of God. That belief was a strong factor in my decision to commit sabotage. During my last years at school, I spent a number of Sundays as a guest of Father Trevor Huddleston and the Fathers of the Community of the Resurrection in Sophia Town. Here, for the first time, I was brought into direct contact with the poverty and suffering of the African community that lived there. I listened to their conversations and heard them speak about their frustrations caused by laws which prevented them from improving their lot and about their hatred, especially for the past laws which disrupted their lives. In the white community, my father was a poor man, but by comparison with the Africans whose homes I went to, he seemed very wealthy. This difference between whites and blacks set the laws which governed them against the whole Christian teaching, which was the basis of my life. As I grew older, I began to believe that this negation was the fault of the whites who governed the country. I also began to believe that those who accepted the situation shared responsibility with those who governed. I began to feel guilty of being white and felt the powerful need to do something myself which could alter the situation. 
President Cyril Ramaphosa quite correctly described Hugh Lewin as an incredible writer and courageous soldier. The judge at that trial, Toss Becker, did not really agree, although he sent Hugh to, quote, the lightest sentence the law allowed, seven years, in addition to the six months he had served while awaiting trial. Lewin's jailmate, Paul Truhuli, wrote, he sought no high office and never trumpeted his name. He always did what he thought was right, no matter the cost. Hugh continued to serve human rights throughout his life in London, in Zimbabwe, and upon his return to South Africa. He furthered human rights, no matter the cost, by opening people's eyes to the meaning of freedom in his work as a journalist, as a writer, his work for NGOs, in the founding of a publishing house, and in his work for the TRC. We, we continue this work in part by opening our own eyes and enlarging our thinking. I therefore welcome you to the fourth annual Hugh Lewin Memorial Human Rights Lecture. And now I'll ask Temwani Chibia from Lower Six to welcome our eminent guest speaker. Welcome everyone. I'm honored to be here this mo morning and to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, the Right Reverend Dr. Vincentia R. Gabe. Reverend Gabe is the first female bishop of Lesotho and the fourth in Africa, and is currently serving as a research fellow in the Desmond Tutu Center for Religion and Social Justice. Before being a bishop, she served for seven years as the rector and principal of the College of Transfiguration Theological College based in Grahamstown which is known to be the only residential seminary and training center in the Anglican Church of South Af Southern Africa. She has served as a parish priest in eight parishes in the College of Di in the Diocese of Johannesburg, as well as the Achtiken and a director of the ordination process in the same diocese. Bishop Kabe has previously carried out duties as chairperson of the board for Hope Africa and the co-chair of the Makani Circle of Unity. Aside from her talents and advocacy, she's passionate about issues of leadership, social justice, and active citizenry. We're grateful for her presence among us today, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Right Reverend Dr. Vincentia Arkabe. Good morning. Good morning. Doesn't feel like a Johannesburg good morning. It feels like a Lesotho good morning. Good morning, Johannesburg. Good morning, good morning St. John's. You may see it. I bring greetings from the people of Lesotho, the mountain kingdom, affectionately known as the kingdom in the sky. In Lesotho, when we greet, we say, Dumela which is both a greeting and an instruction to believe or accept. So what I say, believe it as a gospel truth. The date of the 21st March was proclaimed a public holiday by the first democratic president of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Nelson Mandela. The day was chosen specifically for us to reflect and to be made aware of the need to protect all people's rights from violation, irrespective of gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, whether foreign or not. The 21st of March was not randomly selected. On this date in 1960, 62 years ago in Sharpville, 69 people died, 180 were wounded, and many more continue to carry the emotional scars of that day. 21st of March in 1960, the police fired on peaceful crowd that had gathered in protest against the pass laws. Pass laws were in operation around that time. They controlled the right of black people to residence and travel, 
and where and were implemented using identity documents which were compulsory to carry. While South Africa observes Human Rights Day on the 21st of March, around the world, the 10th of December is the day human rights is observed. In 1948, United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which proclaim the unassailable rights that everyone is entitled to as human beings regardless of race, religion, gender, language, political or other opinion, national or social or origin, poverty, property, birth, or other status. So simply put and simply explained, human rights is that every person has dignity and value. Human rights connect us through a shared set of rights and responsibilities. They cover every aspect of human activity. Human rights are an important part of how people interact with another at all levels of society. So I suspect that when we breathe, when we sit, when we eat, when we learn, when we pray, we practice human rights. This memorial lecture is named after Hugh Lewin. There's been an explanation about Hugh Lewin, but I think I will do a disservice if I don't say anything about him. So who is Hugh Lewin, and why is it important that we remember him and his service to humankind? So I will just briefly summarize his work and his life. Born in Leidenberg in 1939 to English missionary parents, his father was my colleague, an Anglican priest. While Lewin was here at St. John's College, the young Lewin developed an awareness of the wrongs of apartheid. This awareness was partly attributed, attributable to an innate sense of justice and morality acquired at home, and partly to the fact that he often accompanied St. John's teachers to Sophia Town, the multiracial residence area that stood as a symbol of defiance to apartheid. In Sophia Town was located an Anglican parish, Christ the King, that was led by one of the Anglican religious bodies, the Community of the Resurrection, commonly known as the CR Fathers, which had close links to this college. These visits to Sophia Town and the sermons of priests such as the late Archbishop Trevor Huddleston opened Lewin's eyes to the realities of apartheid society. Written works produced by him in the mid-1950s and published in the school magazine reflected an acute awareness and abhorrence of the iniquities wrought by apartheid. Lewin attended Rhodes University, my alma mater, before beginning his journalistic career at Natal Witness in Peter Maritzburg. He also worked at Drum Magazine and Golden City Posts in Johannesburg. In July 1964, when he was 24 years old, Lewin was sentenced to seven years in prison for his activities in the African Re Resistance Movement, a small group of activists that carried out acts of protest sabotage against the apartheid state, targeting, as Lewin wrote in his 2011 memoir, Stones Against the Mirror, that they targeted victims made of metal and concrete, not flesh and blood. Lewin served the full term of his sentence in Pretoria before leaving South Africa on a permanent departure permit in December 1971. So during his years in prison, he secretly recorded his experience and those of his fellow inmates in the pages of his Bible. And on his release, these writings were published in London in 1974, titled Bandit, 
seven years in a South African prison. Hailed as a classic of prison writing, the book remained banned in South Africa for many years until it was published by David Phillip in 1989. So the life and activism of Yulun are summed up in a Yoruba proverb that says, where you sit when you are old shows where you stood in youth. So the theme of this lecture is, I refuse to turn a blind eye or mind my own business until we are all safe. I refuse to turn a blind eye or mind my own business until we are all safe. You and I cannot afford to turn a blind eye or simply mind our own business when we see wrong being done, injustice perpetuated, when human rights are disregarded and life is chippened. We do not have the luxury and cannot afford to fold our arms and watch when unfair systems and practices being implemented or practice, whose intent is not life-giving but life-suffocating. Lewin, surely, just like many of us, had a sermon on how all of us are wonderfully made in the likeness and image of Creator God. Our sacred text reminds us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, that Creator God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, they were created, male and female. God created them. This text reminds us that we have a divine identity. We have moral freedom, we can reason, we have a conscience, and above all, we are wonderfully and purposely created. No one is a mistake. No one is here because something happened when we don't know how you are here. You are here for a purpose. One of the leading canon law scholars, Professor Norman Doe says the following about rights and image of God, and he writes in the context of the Anglican Church. He says, there are two types of rights that are envisioned by the principles of canon law common to the churches of the Anglican Communion. The first is inherent, inherent rights, and secondly, acquired rights. As to the former, all persons equal in dignity before God, have inherent rights and duties inseparable from their dignity as human beings created in the image and likeness of God and called to salvation through Jesus Christ. However, baptism is the foundation of Christian rights and duties, and a church should re respect both sets of rights and duties. All the faithful, ordained and lay, enjoy such rights to government, ministry, teaching, worship, sacraments, rights, and property as may flow from their human dignity. Baptism, the duties of others, and the law of that church. Indeed, in a church, there is to be no unlawful denial of equal rights status or access to the life, membership, government, ministry, worship, rights and property of that church on the grounds. Anglicans should listen to this carefully. There is no way you can deny anyone rights on the grounds of race, color, ethnic, tribal, national origin, marital status, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or age. 
Here, the church is reminded of her responsibility to be a church of all the faithful, a community of all believers. This reminds us that we are made for the community. No one exists for themselves. No man or woman is an island. As Desmond Tutu puts it, if we could but recognize our common humanity, that we do belong together, that our destinies are bound up in one another's, that we can be free only together, that we can be human only together, then a glorious world will come into being where all of us live harmoniously together as members of one family, the human family." Close quote. And Paul, in his letter to the Romans, reminds us and reminds the Romans at that time that none of us lives to themselves and none of us dies to themselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. I would like to use the lens of Ubuntu as I talk of this human family and this community. I am because we are. A person is a person because of others. Moto, gemoto, kabatu. Umuntu, umuntu, ngabantu. Ubuntu has existed for centuries. It is a sub-Saharan Afri sub African culture that refers to the respectful treatment of all people as sharing, caring, and living in harmony with all others and with all creation. Trevor Huddleston, who positively influenced Yuluin's life and countless others, is quoted saying, my responsibility is always and everywhere the same, to see in my brother and in my sister more, than, more even than the personality and personhood that are theirs. My task is always and everywhere the same, to see Christ in them. Professor Thaddeus Metz, in his article published in The Conversation, an online publication, where he explores the concept of Ubuntu, and quoting Desmond Tutu, he writes, we are different so that we can know our need for, of one another, for no one is ultimately self-sufficient. The, com the completely self-sufficient person will be a subhuman. So if you think you have it, you have it all. Desmond Tutu quoted by Professor Metz says, you are a subhuman. And Professor Metz summing up this quote, he says, what gives us dignity is not our independence, but rather our interdependence, our ability to participate and share indeed our vulnerability. So then, what is my role and what is your role? What is this lecture asking us to do or reminding us to do? Our role is to continue to make sure that human rights are upheld everywhere at all times. That we should put ourselves on check in what we say, in how we do it, and where we do it. There is an ever-present threat to human rights. Threats are both internally and externally. As human beings, it seems that we cannot uphold them without being forced, either by legislation or judicial laws. We cannot this by all, do by our own volition. That is why we have Human Rights Commission as a chapter nine institution in South Africa to keep us in check. The commission has the powers as regulated by the national legislation 
necessary to perform its functions, including the power to investigate and to report on the observance of human rights, to take steps to secure appropriate redress where human rights have been violated, to carry out research and to educate. And the Commission has the additional powers and functions prescribed by the national legislation. I suspect they are overworked and maybe underpaid because of so many violations that happen in this country. When a question was posed by one of the scholars of the law in something that has to do with human rights, posed to Jesus, this scholar of the law says to Jesus, teacher, what, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus knew exactly where this was going. In response to the question, he gives a perfect answer. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And that would have made the lawyer very happy. But he added, this is the greatest and the first. But there's a second. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So this was the basis of human rights and caring for us as those made in the likeness and image of God. Someone I'm sure in the crowd, maybe as big as this, was like, brother Jesus, are you real? Do you know what my neighbor looks like and what they do? And you're asking me to love them. And that person maybe might have says, do you know what's happening? Can love that you're talking about and love of neighbor and the love of God address human rights issues such as poverty and increasing global inequities? Can love of neighbor and of God address discrimination, climate and environmental crisis, armed conflict and violence, why is the love of neighbor and the love of God didn't stop what's happening between Russia and Ukraine? Does the love of neighbor and, and the love of God address issues of democracy, democracy deficits and weak institutions? So I will have said in that crowd, and I will say it here, that as an eternal optimist, I concur with Jesus. I say yes, yes, love can cure, love can care, and love liberates. And you and I, as fellow human beings, sharing the divine identity made in the likeness and image of God, can realize that our freedom, my freedom and yours, are linked to each other. We can heal this world. We can treat each other much better than we are doing. And when we do that, love, the agape love, is central to this. Lila Watson, who is known for her advocacy work with the Aboriginal Rights Group in Australia, eloquently said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, let us work together. As I conclude, I hope that I have not wasted your time. I hope you and I and all the institutions and the church included can work together in upholding human rights and being the champions of human rights as we have seen done with a cause by, Lewin, Hugh, by Hugh Lewin, whom we remember today. Championing and safeguarding human rights need us to commit for a long haul and never to get weary or give up. It's going to be a long, tough road because those of you who are 16, 17 years, you have to do this for your grandchildren. You haven't even thought of where you're going to be employed next, but I'm asking you to think about the next generation. We need to commit for a long haul. I have faith that we will get there. I have faith that we have it in us to live peacefully together. 
We need to leave this world, as you have heard others saying, better than how we have found it. I close with the words of a Sudanese proverb that are especially for you, our boys and girls, young people in this place. And the proverb says, we desire to bequeath two things to our children. The first one is roots and the other is wings. Be rooted and fly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Khabe. Um, throughout your speech, I was touched by how you highlighted the importance of recognizing our shared identity, which is our humanity. And through this enabling power, we can transform and change lives. And especially um, within our current climate, you highlight that our institution and as the youth, we need to find the ways in which we can free others and change the communities around us. And for this, I thank you greatly. Please will you accept this as our token of our appreciation. This morning is a very special occasion. Hugh Lewin has asked St. John's to take care of his Bible, his personal Bible that he used while in prison. And it is my joy to ask Miss Fiona Lloyd to come up and say a few words about the Bible and then present it to us as a college. Mrs. Lloyd. Bishop Khabe, Mr. West, staff, and boys of St. John's College, guests and friends. I'm so honored to be with you today to hand over the guardianship of Hugh's Prison Bible. I can think of no better home for it than here the place where, as a young boy, Hugh became fascinated by the power of words and where his first poems and stories were published in your school magazine. Even then, his writing burned from the page as he tried to make sense of the unjust world around him. Hugh was only 24 when he was sentenced to seven years in jail for non-violent sabotage against the apartheid regime. With typical understatement, he described his sentence as a parking ticket. Compared to the experience of other political prisoners, especially those on Robben Island. But anyone who has read his memoir, Bandit, will know how harsh conditions were for Hugh and his fellow inmates in Pretoria. Yet Bandit is also a celebration of the human spirit and of brotherhood. It's rich in detail and dialogue, often cinematic in its immediacy. But how did he manage to remember everything so vividly? The answer lies hidden in the pages of his Bible the one book that every prisoner was allowed. It was here that Hugh kept his secret diary, etched with the sharpest of pencils in the tiniest writing, using a code of abbreviations even he struggled to decipher later. Such a risk. 
If the guards realized what he was doing, the punishment would be terrible. Writing between the lines. Not just to bear witness, but as an act of resistance, an affirmation of human dignity amidst the banal cruelty of prison. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Open Hugh's Bible at any page and see if you can read between the lines. Scavenge for hidden words, camouflaged phrases. It's like trying to spot an animal sheltering deep in the bush. Soften your gaze and wait, because if you try too hard, if you overfocus, you won't find anything. But with soft eyes, you'll see it there, a faint penciled shadow floating above, below, around the darker print. If you're lucky, you might make out a word or two, sometimes numbers, important dates perhaps. So, a young man in a South African jail weaves his diary, infiltrating it between stories of Noah and the ark, and Jesus turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana. This hunger to record, to say, I was here, I lived, I loved, I was loved. Hugh's prison diary shimmers like the handprints of our prehistoric ancestors pressed into the walls of caves, or the graffiti inscribed on shattered houses by survivors of bombs and earthquakes. Hugh's Bible traveled into freedom with him, to London after his release from jail, to Zimbabwe in the early 1980s, to South Africa, when he was finally able to return home. And now it comes to you. If Hugh was here today, what would his message be? Well, I think it might be more of an invitation or maybe a challenge to write, to claim your space between the lines, to keep a record of your life, as the poet Mary Oliver calls it, your one wild and precious life. Here, now, to write fiercely and fearlessly, defying your inner prison guard, the voice in your head that says, you can't write about that. Well, perhaps Hugh would say to you, a journal, is a good place to start. In the beginning was the word. Thank you. Fiona, 
Thank you for this incredible gift to us as a college. I know it's like handing over a child. That that Bible has not only traveled with you, but it has traveled with you as well. And has reminded you daily of his legacy, of his life, of his determination to claim his place and to tell his story. And we commit to you that this Bible will be an inspiration and a provocation to us as a college. That generations of young men and women will daily think about how to tell our story. How to make our love count. How to invest our lives for the sake of others. So that we might not only serve God, but serve our neighbor as we are called to do. I love the fact that when you read between the lines, you get a sense of him claiming his own human dignity before he could give it to others. I also got a sense that he was determined to let his life speak. And so daily he would immerse himself in the word of God, not only to inspire his own life and remind him of God's love, God's light, and God's uh, provision for him, but also so that he could hide his life in God until the time could come where he could tell his story. And so we will prize that beautiful Bible. It will inspire us to play our part in spreading God's kingdom to ensure that all are treated with God's light, God's life, God's love. We make sure that all are treated as children of God, loved by God, made in God's image. And together, we will join hands as a college to spread the message of you, which is everybody's life counts. And what he did in order to fight for a democratic country in South Africa, we will play our part to make sure his legacy is never forgotten, but lives strongly here in the College of St. John. Fiona, thank you so much. Please let's stand. We'll begin with the school prayer. Lord, God our Father, who art light, life, and love, look down in love upon our College of St. John. Make it to be a home of religious discipline, sound learning, and goodwill, which may send forth many rightly trained in body, mind, and character to serve thee well in church and state. Supply our wants and give us increase that shall seem thee good. And may thine angels drive away all evil from us through thy Son, the Savior Jesus Christ. Through love's spoken word, may the Lord bless us. Through our community gathered here, may the Lord keep us. Through gifts of dignity, equality, and freedom, may the Lord inspire us and remind us that goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. And the words spoken here, reminding us to turn love with, to look to dignity, to never say nothing. May the Lord make his face shine upon us, be gracious to us, and give us peace. Amen. I'm going to invite the school custos with the headmaster, Bishop Khabe, um, Mr. Wright, Ms. Lloyd, um, and perhaps the school chaplains to um, process uh, out into the chapel where we will place the Bible um, and for the head of schools to, to dismiss the congregation. Thank you.
May the college please remain standing while I get to the community room.